Hey, that's an awesome project. Okay, so back to spring. I want to show you guys. Okay, I think I show you already like the architectural view of the system, right? So we have in here we have our system running under Apache Tomcat, it's a serverless container, and we have Spring with its components, the controller component, model component, the view component. We're not going to touch the Spring scheduler yet, so let's ignore that part. And then in here we have Hibernate working on the model side, on the model module, right? Hibernate is pretty much using behind the scenes JDBC, Java Database Connectivity, to go against a MySQL database. So that's the only change in there. We're not using hybrid, Hibernate SQL. I'm sorry, HyperSQL. We're using MySQL. And then on the front end, we're going to use web browser uh, through HTTP. So that's a very high level architecture of what the systems, the systems look like. <coughs> okay. So now, we already know what the model, main model looks like. We already know what the UI sketch for this user story looks like. And <coughs> basically, they go through the requirements. And they say, OK, to be able to show a list of timesheets from an employee, OK? I'm going to need, and this is going back to the model. Imagine this. Look at the model. Imagine that we have one employee login, and we need to grab all the timesheets from that guy. And then we need to do a list. And according to the UI sketch, at least the first version of this UI sketch, I need to provide the following three pieces of information on the list. The period ending date from the timesheet, the total number of hours from that timesheet, and the timesheet ID. That's all the only three, thi three things that I'm going to be delivering. Okay? The only three things I'm going to be delivering time timesheet list. Now, to be able to do that, first of all, do I have a timesheet class? Yes, I do. Cool. So that's taken care of. At least I know what a timesheet looks like. Do I have a timesheet list class? No. Do I need one? After all, I'm not grabbing one. I'm grabbing a list of. I might need a timesheet list entity. I don't know at this point. Or we could probably handle it as a list. You guys are familiar with lists, right? List is one of the data structures in Java. Um, we could probably uh, manage it as a list. In fact, list is an interface, so it's not even a class. So that means that we'll have to implement a specific type of class, probably a vector or an array list. Depends. Uh, we might have to implement it as, an array, as a vector. Okay? But we also need something else. In order to grab the timesheets of a particular employee, I need the help of somebody a class that is an expert in timesheets. A timesheet is a timesheet, but I don't have an expert in timesheets. What does the expert in timesheets do? The expert in timesheets knows how to save a timesheet in the database, retrieve a timesheet from the database, retrieve a whole bunch of timesheets from the database, delete them, create them, so pretty much, this guy is going to do the, the CRUDs. And the CRUDs is the create, the read, the update, and the deletes for the entity. So 
So this is what you guys have to build in your project for next week. You have to build your timesheet manager, your main entity manager. And this is what your main entity manager will look like. In fact, this is what it will look like in Timex. It's a class. Doesn't inherit from anybody. It's a Pojo. Plain old Java object. Okay? But this guy doesn't have any attributes whatsoever. This guy does. Does not contain. It does. Timesheet contains. Timesheet manager does. What is this timesheet manager capable of? This timesheet manager is capable of getting me timesheets. Look at this. Get timesheets. And I pass an employee ID. Cool. That's exactly what I want. I pass an employee ID. I say, let's say, employee number one, give me all the timesheets. And he gives me back all the timesheets. What else is it capable of? It's also capable of giving me one timesheet and I pass two parameters the employer ID and the period ending date so I say wait a minute I just want one timesheet I want a timesheet from Ajay Kumar from August 15 2006 and it will give me back one timesheet what else is it capable of? it's capable of saving a timesheet so I just give it a timesheet hey here it is save it persist it in the database what is it else capable of? It's getting all the timesheets. Oh, pretty cool. Getting all the timesheets. What about this one? Getting all the timesheets with a specific status code. Okay, so what if I want... Okay, give me all the timesheets that are approved. And I pass the A for approved. Or give me all the ones that have been submitted. I pass the S for submit it, and it will give me those. So pretty much, as you can see, Timesheet Manager is the guy that is going to have a whole bunch of functions that you are going to need in your system to provide specific functionality. Where does that functionality come from? From the user stories. Okay, so for now, next week, you just need to provide one equivalent to Timesheet Manager with one function, the one that it's going to give you the list of. So in this case, we are creating the Timesheet Manager with the Get Timesheet list. So what does Get Timesheets do? You pass an employee ID which is an integer, and it's going to return a list of timesheets. See this? So we're going to tr we're going to treat our result as a list, as in the Java collection list, which is generic. If you're using 1.5 and above, which we should, you guys should be in 1.6 and in 6.0 actually. If we're using 6.0, it's capable of doing generics. You guys are familiar with generics, right? It's one of those Java features in which you can actually tell a class what type of Java object it will be manipulating. So in this case, you're telling hey list, you are going to be manipulating timesheets. Timesheets. So what is it going to return in here? It's going to return a list of timesheets. How do we do that? How do we return a list of timesheets from a particular employee? Well, first of all, we create a variable that it's of that type and we initialize it with null. Right? And then, you guys remember the hibernate util? Remember that class? Let's take a look at the Hibernate test. The Hibernate test, which is the one that we did last week,
had a main. And that main, you had to go into the, com the Hibernate configuration and build a session factory and then open the session and all that stuff. Well, guess what? For the project, we're going to have a class called the Hibernate Util that is going to do that for us. And I explained last week that this, it was a singleton. So it's a class that can only be created one instance of in the entire project. And then what you do is that new configuration configure build session factory will be saved in a constant variable called session factory. So you can always ask the Hibernate Util, hey, give me the session factory, and it will always return the same one. So that's exactly what we're going to be doing here. We're going to say, hey, Hibernate Util, give me the session factory and get the current session. And we're going to save it inside the method that we, that we want to get all the timesheets of. And then we tell the session, you know, very similar to our Hibernate test. This is very similar to the test that we did or that we were supposed to do for tonight. We say, OK, session, let's start the transaction. So we begin the transaction. This is what I want you to do. I want you to create a query. And the query is going to be from timesheet. From is a reserved word in, hiber, in Hibernate query language, HQL. From timesheet. Timesheet refers to the timesheet class, not the table, the class from timesheeted where where is a reserve word in hql employee id employee id is a property or should be a property of the timesheet class equals question mark and it's a reserve word in hql status code should also be a property of timesheet different then paid. Oh, wow. So getting the timesheets from an employee according to the functional requirement is give me all the timesheets that have not been paid. Those include what? Those include pending, submitted, approved, disapproved, and you have to go through the finite state machine, remember? The finite state machine of your main entity, that's the one that says, hey, if you are submitted, then you go to accepted or rejected. If you are accepted, then you can go to paid, etc. You know, all the different statuses of your main entity. So in this case, getting the timesheets from an employee it's getting absolutely all the timesheets except those that have been paid. And that's exactly what we're doing here in this query. From timesheet where employee ID equals question mark, and we're going to be filling out that question mark with a parameter. And status code different than timesheet.paid. So the first question is, where do we get that parameter that is going to replace the question mark. Well, if you guys remember, we're passing as a parameter the employee ID that we want all to get the, the timesheets from. So after we say session create query, what do we do? We say dot set integer because we know that that parameter is going to be an integer. Now, don't always use set integers. Some of the parameters are going to be strings, so you will do a set string, or you will do a set date, or you will do, do you get the point. In this case, it's set integer, and then sub zero indicates the first parameter. That means that you, you can pass several parameters, and it will take, it will parse from left to right. The first question mark will be sub zero. The second question mark will be sub one, etc. And you can set the values of those with the set type set integer parameter or question marks of zero and then you pass the employee <coughs> the employee ID this one that is being passed as a parameter okay I don't like
like how this is broken. Let me let me see if I can. There you go. It's actually it's a very long statement. That's that's why the way that it was broken is kind of weird. There you go. So we're saying okay. That should create a query, and we'll pass a whole query, right? Now, as part of that query, um, we're going to set the parameter, and this is how we set the parameter. Now, not only that, we're also, as part of the query, we're passing timesheet paid. Remember, timesheet paid is a constant of timesheet. It's one of those constants that says, okay, this timesheet is C means it's paid, um, A means approved, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they're all part of the constants that make it part of the um, of the timesheet. So in this case, we're actually building the query from timesheet with employee the equals question mark status code equal to timesheet paid from the constant. I'm sorry, not equal not equal to C, which is paid. So you're getting all the timesheets from this employee ID that the status code is different than C. That's basically what it comes down to. And then set integer, let me put it this way then. I think it's better if I just, there you go. So this is how you create the query. Right? Right there you you creating the query. Right? This whole thing is the query. And then after you create the query, you said, okay, but I'm going to set an integer into the query. And the integer is going to replace parameter sub zero, and it's going to be this value, employee ID. And you can keep doing dot set string sub one comma and then you pass a value. And then dot set date sub two and you pass you know, if you have three question marks, for instance, you will be doing set whatever type zero and then the next one, set whatever type one and then set it, whatever type, to get it, until you pass all the different values for the parameters. That's so you do not, that's so you do not put in here the value. So in other words, we're not going to be managing the query, it's going to be the session that manages the query. And then at the end, when we're done setting all the different parameters, what are we expecting? We're expecting a list. So we're asking for dot list. If we were expecting for only one, then we will do a dot unique result because we know that we should get only one. But in this case, we're getting many. And this, again, is going back to you knowing exactly what kind of relationships your entities have. In this case, we know that one employee can have many timesheets. So we're expecting for one employee many timesheets. So we're building lists. And then this session will go out into the database, create the query against timesheet table, come back with the result set, create all these objects automatically for you, and it will give you back a list. And it will be saved right here in timesheet list variable. That's the end of the transaction. So what we're going to do is we're going to tell the transaction, hey, commit it. And then what is the method going to return? It's going to return a timesheet list. That's it. Yeah. Why, the question is, why do we choose list as the data structure to grab a bunch of timesheets? It's the simplest one. 
from the Java perspective, from the Java collections perspective, list is the simplest one. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so next week you guys have to make sure you create your main entity manager with one function. Okay. What else do we need? So at this point we have, okay, we have a guy that is an expert in getting me the timesheets out of the database. From the architectural point of view, and this is going back to this, from the architectural point of view, what have I done? I have done this little piece. What else am I missing? I'm missing what's going to be the view that is going to show me the list. Who's going to be the controller that when it sees in the URL or somewhere, hey, give me a list, it will say, oh, okay, I know exactly who can help me. And it will go into the timesheet manager and ask for that. And then it will say, okay, I want you to use this view. We need that. We're missing that part, the controller. And we're also missing the view. And that's where that's where Spring um, comes into action. Okay? And this is a sample class diagram of that of that piece that I'm trying to convey to you. We have the timesheet. <coughs> We have a timesheet manager that knows a bunch about timesheets. We need a timesheet list controller that is going to be able to control the query and know exactly who to delegate it to. And we're also going to need, um, this is wrong, this is not enter house controller, this should be timesheet list controller. Oh, here it is, timesheet list controller. And we're also going to need the view. The view is going to actually tell us what it's going to look like. Okay, so to be able to do that, we're going to have to create a new package in our project. And this package is going to be called COM Timex Web Controllers. This package will hold absolutely all the controllers in our project. Now, the Timesheet Manager or whatever Entity Manager they can live in the same package as the entities themselves. So it's fine if you put them in the same in the same package. But for the controllers, we're going to need a separate pr uh, package. OK, how do we add Spring Framework to our project? And keep in mind, we're using Spring 1. Point something, a very old version of Spring. Basically, what we did was we copied a whole bunch of jars into our library. And if you pay attention, you will see that we have a Spring.jar, a Spring-Hibernate3.jar, a Spring Mock. Those are the Spring framework jars. Okay? And the first change that I need to do in my project to convert it, in other words, to use the Spring framework is the Web XML. If you guys remember, the Web XML is the one that tells me what's going to be the main page. And it's going to tell me what are the servlets that will service my web application. Well, the first change that we're going to be doing is going to be changing the servlet. The main page we can keep, but the servlets that we're going to need must come from the Spring Framework. Okay? And basically, Forget about display name and description, they're just optional. 
The welcome file list is going to be the same as index.jsp. Somehow we're going to have index.jsp that, you know, we go to. That's the first page, the home page. But the most important thing is that the servlet, we've got to create a servlet. Now the servlet name must have, must be the same name as the project. So in this case, our project is called Timex underscore web. So the servlet name is going to be, have the same name as the project. Now, the servlet is going to be executed by this particular Spring Framework class. It's called the Dispatcher Servlet. And if you guys remember, I explained that earlier when we were looking at the architecture. This Dispatcher Servlet is going to be the servlet in the Spring Framework that will trigger the whole thing. That's the guy that is going to trigger the whole um, Spring Framework so that it will help us build our project. And remember, every servlet from the from the uh, homework that you guys were supposed to hand, uh, turn in, I think it was like two or three weeks ago, uh, remember every servlet has a URL pattern associated to it. Typically it has an, uh, a, URL, a URL string. Not so much a pattern, but a URL string. Like uh, I think it was called first servlet, the first one that we created, first servlet. That it, all it did was hello world. Well, in this case, what we're going to do is every URL pattern that ends in htm, and this is what star.htm means. Every URL pattern that that ends in star.htm will be handled by this servlet, the spring servlet. That's how we know, that's how we know from this perspective what kind of requests are going to be handled by the Spring Framework. So in fact at this point you guys can create all the entire project just as HTML mockups and put them all into web content. HTML files that end in HTML and we can run it on Tomcat and it won't be any different than what you guys did in CSIS 3020 and you ran it under Apache that it was just plain static website we can do that and we can go from the home page login to timesheet list and all that stuff pretty nice under Tomcat, because Tomcat is Apache is running under Apache. But the minute the URL request changes from whatever 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 dot HTML to whatever whatever dot HTM, then it will be handled by this servlet. And this servlet, the first thing that it's going to do going to say, wait a minute, I need to see a configuration file that tells me if I see this in the URL, this is going to be the controller that is going to take care of it, and this is going to be the view that is going to be rendered. So we need to provide not only the change of the web XML as you are seeing, but we also need to provide a configuration XML, sort of like the configuration XML from Hibernate, that will tell Spring how the project is going to be handling all the requests. And that file, it's going to be called the name of the project, first of all, it lives under webinf because it is a web configuration file. So same as the XM web XML, it's going to live under webinf. What's going to be the name 
it's going to be the same name as the project. So if your project is called Timex underscore web, it should be Timex underscore web dash servlet dot XML. Okay? So whatever the name of your project, dash servlet dot XML. Dispatcher servlet knows that. You will go look for it. And this is what the Timex web underscore web server looks like. Basically you are going to declare a whole bunch of beans. I mean in in, in spring and this is coming um, this is coming back from the this schema that was published many years ago. It's called the spring beans schema. And you guys remember this is going back, back to CSIS 3020 where I explain what is an XML file, what is an XML uh, domain, what is an XML schema, and all that stuff. This schema is the one that rules over what XML is appropriate for Spring Framework. So this schema will say, I know where a bean is, I know, know what a property is, I know what props is, I know, know what, uh, you know, pretty much what a ref is. I think that's, that's most of the, you know, most of them is values, property, refs, beans. I know what they stand for and what they look like. And that's, that's pretty much what you guys are going to be putting inside this XML. Okay, so basically this you are this XML is going to say okay, Spring. We're going to have one controller. This controller. It's going to be called the Timesheet List Controller. Okay. So we're going to have to create a class that represents that controller, and we're going to be doing that. <coughs> and this controller will need a few properties. And I'm going to be injecting those properties. In other words, the controller doesn't need to know how those properties are instantiated, how they're being created. They will just they will just be injected to the uh, class so that the, the class can use it. The properties are going to be the timesheet manager. That's the expert in timesheets, and that's it. And I'm also going to in inject a property called success view, which has a hard-coded value, and the hard-coded value is going to be timesheet list. Very well. Another thing is, is we're going to have another controller. It's going to be the call, it's going to be called the URL file name controller. And the URL file name controller basically says, whatever shows up in the URL must match a file name in your project. Whatever shows up in the URL is going to have to match to a file name in your project. And this is how we're going to handle this is how we're going to handle the URL mappings to the controllers. So we create a bean called the simple URL handler mapping. It's also one of those Spring Framework classes. And what we declare in there, it's a property called URL map. And the URL map is basically a whole bunch of key value pairs that we're going to be injecting into this class. And the key value pairs are going to be the URL, that's the key, and the value is going to be the name of the controller that will handle it. 
So at this point, what have I set to spring? All I've said is, whenever you see the URL timesheetlist.htm, whenever you see in the browser a request that says timesheetlist.htm, it's going to be handled by timesheet list controller. So there's going to be a, a timesheet list controller in here. And I'm going to inject, here it is, the timesheet list controller. I'm going to inject into that timesheet list controller represented by this class. I'm going to inject a timesheet manager and a success view. That's it. So this property, timesheet manager, let's analyze it for a second. It has a reference to another bean. So this timesheet manager property, it's not something hard coded. It's not like a, it's not like an expression or a value like in this case for the success view. It's actually another bean, another bean called timesheet manager. And indeed, here they are. We are declaring all our managers. In fact, I'm declaring too many of them. At this point, I only have one manager, the timesheet manager, who is represented by this class. I mean, we already created that class. Okay. So you see how simple the XML starts like? You need a URL mapper, a simple URL handler mapping class that says, okay, for this URL, it's going to be handled by this controller. And we're going to start building it with a whole bunch of mapping of mappings. We need this one, which is the one that maps the URL to a file name. We need this one, which is going to be our specific timesheet list controller. So we're going to have to create this timesheet list controller class. Okay. And we need we also have this timesheet manager, which we already have it in, in our code. So let's build our timesheet list controller. Here it is. This is what our timesheet list controller looks like. First of all, it's not a POJO. It's a class that must implement the controller interface from the MVC Spring Framework. Okay, and if you guys go into the book, that section that talks about the different, here it is. This is the class diagram, it's sort of like a snapshot picture of what the Spring Framework looks like, at least the 1.0 version. Notice that all controllers in Spring inherit or implement the controller interface. That is an interface. And there is an abstract controller, and uh, under that we have an abstract URL view controller, and a base command controller, and a premit. All these controllers are of a different type, and they're used for different purposes. In this case, the one for the timesheet list controller, which is the one that is going to provide us a list of timesheets, it's fine if we just say, you know what, it's a controller. It's a very high level controller. It's fine if we just make it implement that interface. Now, uh, a tip from for some of you guys that um, probably try to find out what the controller source code looks like. When you click on it, it's going to give you this cryptic um, class saying, you know, the source cannot be found. I cannot attach it. So what you can do is you can actually download the source code from the web, unzip it into your hard drive or whatnot, and then attach it attach that source code to Eclipse so that every time that you want to see 
the source code of any of the classes that come from the Spring Framework, you can actually see it. Okay, so that's a really good thing. In my case, um, let me see if I ever downloaded the Hanate. And then I suggest that you extract that file. And put it off your C drive. So I'm going to cut it from here and I'm going to put it in my C drive. There you go. So now if you go in there, you should see the distribution. Here it is, string source, the zip. So it's going to be a zip file. So going back to Eclipse, you're going to indicate that it's an external file. When you want to attach the source code for Spring, Eclipse, you're going to indicate that it's an external file. And you're going to take Eclipse into the Spring Framework Distribution Spring Source Zip. So now, right there, you're telling Eclipse where it can find a source code for here it is you're looking at the source code for the controller interface do you guys actually see how simple this interface is I mean there's there's a lot more comments to it than the actual code look at the code the code is public interface controller. You're going to implement handle request. Handle request is going to return a model in view. And it's going to accept two parameters, the request and the response. The request is of HTTP server request. Familiar? That's what a HTTP server is. HTTP request and HTTP server response and it might throw an exception. That's it. So timesheet list controller which implements this interface, all it has to do is provide a handle request function. Very simple. And here it is. Handle request. That's all the timesheet controller is. It's a function that is going to implement the handle request. So you have to provide the same signature as the interface. What's the signature? The signature is the name of the function, the parameters in the function, the return type of the function. They have to be identical. If you don't put them identical, then your Java is not implementing that interface. Can you guys tell me the two lines of code in the timesheet list controller that is going to handle the request? Look at this. Two lines of code is going to handle my entire timesheet list request. Hey, timesheet manager, get timesheets for employee ID 1. But wait a minute. Where am I getting the timesheet manager from? Did I ever create a new timesheet manager? Blah, blah, blah. No. Nowhere in here I'm creating a new timesheet manager. How is the timesheet list controller going to know that there is a timesheet manager? Because it has a getter and setter. Oh, look at this. So you created 
a private timesheet manager variable of type timesheet manager and you, you could have called this T manager or whatever okay and you provide a getter and setter for it and spring will automatically inject the proper object timesheet manager into the timesheet list controller so that the controller can use it that's another advantage of the spring framework it's also called inversion of control and I want you guys to go out there and read a little bit about inversion of control and what is it about okay you can go to Martin Fowler's website or can you you can go to the Wikipedia and it will tell you exactly what inversion of control is it's a principle it's a principle of software architecture that allows you to build this principle allows you to build in a very dynamic very modular way a web application not only web application but a whole system in this case we're building a web application so we're applying it to a web application and it tells you exactly what inversion of control is and that's exactly what you're looking at here I have a timesheet list controller that is providing the implementation of a function called handle request and all it's doing is saying hey timesheet manager I, I want you to get me all your timesheets for employee one and I don't care where timesheet manager is coming from how it's created or anything like that all I know is that I need his help and I'm calling him and the spring framework will inject the timesheet manager into the controller through getters and setters let's backtrack a little back to the XML the configuration do you guys remember this the timesheet list controller represented by this class has a property called timesheet manager if I call this property TS manager I have to call this getter TS manager. If I call this property Peter Paul, I have to call this getter get Peter Paul. That's the link right there. That's the link. Okay? And this property has a reference to a bean, and this bean, you can call it whatever you want, okay? But this bean has to exist in this XML configuration. This bean timesheet manager is represented by this class, which we already discussed what it looks like and what it does. You got it? Once the timesheet manager comes back and says, hey, Here's the list of timesheets for Ajay Kumar, which is employee number one. What do you do with it? You're going to return a model and view. Whatever that is, you're creating a new model and view. So let's take a look at the model and view. Notice what happened when I just attached the source code. Now all of a sudden I'm getting all this helpful, helpful stuff when I hold over. It's pretty cool. Model in view, it's a convenient constructor to take a single model object. Model and view. Model and view. In fact, that's exactly what I need. I need the controller to provide a model and a view of my request because that's the function of the controller to know exactly what model should be in charge and to know exactly what view should be in charge of this request you want to take a look at the source code here it is model and view Modeling view is just a holder 
nothing else than a holder. And notice that it's it's a class that doesn't inherit from anybody else. And it's probably one of the after controller, it's one of probably one of the most important classes in the Spring framework. It's a holder. Just a holder. For what? For both the model and the view in the MVC framework. Cool. So what are we going to construct here? What are we going to return here? We're going to return the model and view. And we're going to be passing three parameters. The view name. The view name is the first parameter. Very well. The second one is the model name. And the third one is model object. Where, what are we passing as the model, I'm sorry, as the view name? Get success view. What is that get success view? Oh, get success view is a getter. It's a getter and setter. In fact, we have a private string property called success view, and we have a getter and setter for it. Wait a minute, is this also injected? You bet it is. Here it is. Property success view. And again, if you call this property Peter Paul, then you're going to have to have in the controller a getter called Peter Paul. And a setter, especially a setter. Look at this. We're actually passing the name of the view where the controller has to go after the request. It's called timesheet list. Cool. Okay. So when you say get success view, what is it going to do? It's going to return the success view which got injected, which is timesheet list. So what are we doing? We're passing as the view name, we're passing timesheet list. Awesome. What else are we passing? We're passing map key. What is map key? Map key is actually a constant that we created here called timesheets. Oh, okay. Well, actually, the constant is called map key, and the value of the constant is timesheets. Oh, wow. So that's going to be the name of the model, timesheets. What about the model object? The model object is going to be the list of timesheets that the timesheet manager gave me back. So, ah, okay, I'm getting it. So model in view is actually a holder that is going to say, okay, when you're done with this request, you're going to go to timesheet list view. And you're going to have an object called timesheets that is going to be represented by this variable called timesheets. This variable. And this variable is going to be a list. It's actually going to be a list being passed over from the timesheet manager. Cool. So now we have now we have our model timesheet and timesheet manager. We have our controller that is creating the holder model in view. All we need to do is send it to the view so that it displays it. What is it going to do? Well, it's going to s try to find a view called timesheet list and provide this map key called timesheets with a list of timesheets and let it the view do its thing. In fact, its thing is supposed to be its thing is supposed to be
this UI sketch. This is the first version. So it's a it's a table of period ending date, number of hours, and timesheet ID, which I later on modified into a second version. You know, after going through the requirement analysis, etc. It's not displaying. I don't know why, but. It looks like this. So it's actually telling me who is the employee, the peer ending date, the number of hours, what is the department being charged for it, what's the status of the timesheet, and then the timesheet ID. Can anybody tell me what this is coming from? This is a screenshot of an HTML mockup. Fine. So at this point all I have to do is take my HTML mockup and rename it .jsp and rename it .jsp and that's what is going to be the view in our Spring Framework. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to grab from the author's code, I'm going to bring over, first of all, I'm going to bring over the timesheet list HTML because that's the mockup. I want you guys to see it. So under web inf, I'm sorry, under their web content, I'm going to bring the timesheet list. In fact, we can open it with the web browser from from Eclipse, and this is what it's going to look like. This is my HTML mockup. It's called timesheet list.html. Okay. Notice that this is an anchor, this is another anchor, this is another anchor. I'm not going to do anything, but... Okay. This is what it's going to look like. So if I rename it as a JSP and then start working my way with Java server scripting, and this is something that I need you guys to get familiar with either online or whatever it's called JSP um, commands There's several websites where you can go. It's probably it's not a good one. It's very slow. Yeah. I think the best one is, I think it's called JSTL. tutorial Java server pages standard tag libraries yep this is the one this one is a tutorial on JSPs and it will tell you exactly how to convert your HTML into JSPs I mean there's more than just HTML in a JSP obviously but that's where you start you start from the HTML and then you start adding Java server pages um, 
HTML tags. They're called JSTLs because they come from the Java server page uh, library. Until you transform that timesheet list.html into something like this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create inside the web inf I'm going to create a folder. A new folder called JSP. And this is where I'll be saving all the JSPs. And you know why I want to do that? Because I don't want anybody to have access to the actual JSP uh, functionality within the web content. So anything inside the web inf will not be compromised by the server. Okay, That's the one that has all the configuration and stuff. So I'm going to build a JSP folder inside the web inf and this is where I'll be putting all my JSPs. So this is timesheet list HTML. Notice everything is hard coded. It's HTML. It's a table with TRs, TDs, etc., etc. And this is the timesheet list JSP. Okay, sort of that same stuff almost. It has tables, but notice there are two main things up here. And this is where you declare what kind of libraries you're going to be using. Because remember, now it's a JSP. So we're going to be using the JSTL core and the JSTL FMT libraries. And each one of them will have a prefix. The JSTL core will have the C prefix, and the JSTL FMT will have the FMT prefix. And the way to distinguish this is if you see a tag that is prefixed by the C, you know it comes from the core. If it's prefixed from by the FMT, then it comes from the FMT library. Basically, these two libraries give extra HTML tags functionality to the page. Okay? What kind of functionality are we talking about? Functionality like the see if. See if is actually a conditional tag where you pass a parameter called a test. And if the test is true, it will render whatever is inside the see if. If the test is not true, it will not do any rendering. It will not display anything. It will just skip. Okay? Stuff like, for instance, um, what else? What else? C for itch. This is how you do a for loop in Java server pages. It's called C for itch. Okay? And what you do is you pass the items that you want to. Um, traverse and you provide a local variable that is going to represent every element of that items collection. And the rest of the stuff is just HTML. Okay. So let me see if this will work. I'm not even sure if this is going to work or not. Okay, I think we're missing some configuration in the Spring Surlet XML. And that configuration is that configuration is a spring class that will transform the timesheet list view name to a timesheet list JSP file. We're missing that one now that I remember. So let's
let's go back into the code that was provided by the author and somewhere in here here it is it's called the view resolver I must have gotten rid of it and this view resolver actually is going to be very handy later on, later on when we start modifying our application so that instead of going to JSP views it's going to go into a JSON view or an XML view that can be consumed by a mobile application an application running on an Android for instance so there's another section of the spring configuration called view resolver and the view resolver is going to tell me how that view name is going to be handled by spring in this case the view resolver is represented by a spring framework class called the internal resource view resolver and we pass three properties to that class the first the first property is going to call we can call the view class and the view Notice that we're telling it that it's going to be a JSTL view. JSTL, again, it stands for the Java Server Pages Tag Library. So basically we're saying, hey, it's going to be a bunch of tag library, Java tag libraries. Notice that we have a prefix property. What's the prefix? WebInf JSP. Oh, so this is the prefix that it's going to... Uh, use to go and look for that file in the project. So it's going to go from the root, it's going to go into the w um, the root you know is the web content, right? It's going to go from the web content and it's going to look for a webinf and inside the webinf it's going to look for a JSP folder. And then there is a suffix and the suffix is what's going to put after the name of the view. And what's going to be the suffix? JSP. So if we provide the view name timesheet list, which we did here, this is the name, timesheet list, what is it going to resolve it to? It's going to resolve it to from web content slash webinf slash JSP slash timesheet list. JSP. Got it? That's how it knows that, hey, I'm going to be looking on their web content for WebInf JSP, a JSP called TimesheetList.JSP. All right, guys, you want to see it running? Before we go, let's run it on the server. Now we're not going to run it as a Java application because we're not going to be running a main anymore. Now we're going to run it as a web application on the server, on the Tomcat server. Look at the console. Whoo! Problems. Problems, problems. This is my Timex, this is my index.jsp. Actually, this is one of the uh, free templates that I found out there. And all I have to do is grab the CSS and put it into JSP and it gives me a new look which is what I want you guys to do for your project by the way some of you have really good nice look and feel others need some help so please go out there to free templates hey you just grab a CSS apply it to your HTML mockups you can do it to the mockups and you, you will get a nice um, look and feel for your website, even if it's just for the HTML mockups for now. 
Um, so it did the index JSP. That's good. At least we're getting there. But if we go into the console, the console is telling me that we have problems. Let me see. Let's read the console. The console says, oh, I'm initializing servlet Timex Web. Okay, so it found, at least it found the servlet. Then it says, framework Timex Web initialized started. Oh, cool. So now it says, loading XML. Look at this, loading XML bean definition. So, okay, so it found it. See that? Timex Web dash servlet and XML. It found it. Bean factory for application context, so and so. Six beans defined. Oh, cool. So it found my six beans. What are my six beans? Here they are. Placeholder config, URL map, URL file name and controller, timesheet list controller, timesheet manager, and view resolver. Those are my six beans. Those are the ones that I define in the XML. Ooh, here's where the problem is. Could not load properties nested exception could not open server context resource timex web dash server that properties oh okay so somehow i gotta have a timex underscore web dash server that properties resource that i'm missing okay And it keeps saying that I cannot load the Timex web dash level properties. Okay, so I must be missing that uh, properties file. Let's see, did the author share that with us? Oh, yeah, he did. Here it is. So I'm going to copy it. And I'm going to. It's supposed to live under the webinf. So I'm going to paste it into the webinf. And I'm going to restart my server. Awesome. Did you guys see that? No more exceptions. This is how a successful start should look like. Okay? It should say. Uh, initializing servlet, framework servlet, blah blah blah. I'm loading on all the beans. I'm loading six beans. It should have the same kind, the same number of beans that you define in the XML. Uh, if there's unable to locate such and such thing, don't ignore that. Those are not errors. Using context, no handle adapters, blah blah blah. Configure successfully. Servlet timex underscore web configure successfully. This is the framework servlet which was configured successfully. And then at the end it should say server started in 1736 microseconds. This is what it should look like. Now, at this point, even though I loaded my index.jsp, which is nothing more than my homepage.html converted into a JSP, that's all I've did. That's all I've done. What what is going to trigger my Spring Framework? What is going to trigger my Spring Framework? My Spring Framework is going to be triggered if it finds in the URL something like timesheet timesheet list dot htm. Is that correct? Oh, you don't remember? Let's take a look at the configuration file. If you see a slash timesheet list dot htm, here it is. So I'm going to put it in here. If you see, paste it. If you see that in the URL, call the dispatcher servlet, which will call the timesheet list controller which will take care of the request. Hit it. 
Whoa, look at all that's going on behind the scenes. Got it. This is the actual timesheet list for a J. Kumar. You want me to prove it? Let's go back to the database. The database says timesheet list for employee ID 1R. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I have in my database 6 records under the timesheet table for employee ID 1. How many did I list here? Four. Uh oh. What happened? Do you remember the functional requirement for timesheet list? Give me all except paid. Are any of these paid? These two here are paid. But this one is approved, 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 pending. So I should see three approves and one pending. Going back, three approves, one pending. In fact, they are timesheet IDs four, five, seven, and eight. Four, five, seven, and eight. Got it. Now, what's the really neat thing, and this is something that I want to, I want you to take it with you and think about it. What's the really neat thing about the way that we develop it here? I know there's many pieces to it. It's that once you visualize your system and who are the main entities, from here on, adding functionality is going to be so fast because what you have to do is, oh, you have the entity, let's create a manager that knows how to do the CRUDs on that entity. Fine. So we're going to provide one or two functions that are going to be needed in the manager. Then you provide a controller. And the controller, all it's going to do is going to be, okay, I'm going to be implementing the handler, the request handler, which is a function that is going to return a model and view. That's it. So you use the manager to grab, to do this or that or the other, create a model view, and that's it. That's all the controller is going to do. And then you provide the view, which is nothing more than a modified HTML that ends in a JSP and uses all these funny HTML tags. So we have to find out how these funny HTML tags work, like the C if, the C for each, or whatever that we need, so that we can display something like this. And really, adding a functional requirement comes down to what? Comes down to adding a function in the manager that provides you the data. A controller that will handle the request. When you see this, 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 or the other, that HTM, handle it. And then the view, which is going to be a Java server page, very similar. In fact, it's almost identical to the HTML mockup that will render the contents. And you start cranking functional requirements like crazy. Do you have to get involved with SQL queries and a whole bunch of other JDBC, like loading, creating new um, classes and instantiating the values into getters and setters so that you can manipulate not at all that's isolated for you that's taken care of so that you can concentrate on the actual functional requirement that you want to build 